while well, everyone's been kind of using Amazon Web Services, EC2, and other sort of like systems where you have lots and lots of identical machines which are set up and like have all their configuration files and all the services started and installed by a single like source of truth, and that is generally either pub or shell. And that works pretty well in that, in that system, and I think they're great tools. When it doesn't work quite so well is when you start using things like Market and Chef for systems that people are interacting with also themselves. So, Box would do things like install packages from home for you. But if the user decides that they don't want a particular package installed, or they kind of want to use a different version or whatever, then after Box and Run, they might go and you know, brew on install some stuff or brew install some other stuff, or run link, or link stuff, or switch versions, or whatever. And then what happens is, next time Boxen runs, Boxen explodes, because Boxen is like, well, I thought everything was in this particular state, and it's kind of based around moving from one state to another, and then as a result, it would get upset. And the problem is, as well, Boxen being built on Puppet, Puppet is designed mainly to be consumed by kind of DevOpsy people or operations people, and as a result, when you have, particularly in the application, non-technical users are presented with screens of puppet output saying, you know, it's, I've exploded in a particular way, that became very, very difficult for them to kind of figure out what was going on. So, as a result, eventually we ended up stopping using Boxing for non-technical people at GitHub, and then eventually stopped using it for technical people as well. So. I kind of worked on building a solution for this instead to kind of try and kill and replace Boxing, which was, um, I won't go into too much detail about what, how Boxing itself worked, but basically what I wanted to try and do is push more of the logic that lives in Boxing in this big model and repo into a few other projects. Being a homebrew maintainer, I'm kind of biased towards homebrew, so I was like, okay, I'm going to try and get homebrew to solve some of these problems, and then I'm going to try and get, um, like, various other tools that already exist to solve some of the other problems and then write new tools when they want to require. So Boxing was like a big, kind of, as I mentioned, like public and Ruby project and I replaced it with this, a part of it with this thing called Strat. So Strat is, I guess, a couple of hundred lines of shell script instead and it's really pretty simple. Like it basically just sets up effectively like a bare minimum of what I consider like everyone at GitHub and more in general, like every kind of Mac developer to kind of want to set up their system. And it's got a nice little like box and had a nice little web application you can go and use. So the first thing you do, you present your new laptop at GitHub after you might kind of fiddle around with it and make sure the install can be successfully into your users or whatever is you go and hit up the site we have running strap.github.com. And that's basically just a really simple web service that has no backend data store or anything like that. All it does is it uses your GitHub authentication credentials to go and authenticate with the site and then generate a slightly modified version of the strap script which just has your credentials embedded in there so it can kind of set up all your kind of cloning and stuff like that because that process is not always completely straightforward, fitly for less than. So you can basically just follow these steps here. You probably can't be getting the text because it's quite small. But basically, there's one custom step which is for GitHub people that tells them to uninstall Boxing. Then you just download the single script by clicking the link there, which uses the kind of generated GitHub credentials in there. And you run the script, and then it tells you how to report errors if there are any. And then afterwards, you can just delete the script and then use Homebrew, which Strap installs for you, or you want to use it. So, the nice thing about Strap is it doesn't install very much software. It doesn't install actually any software from Homebrew itself. It basically just sets everything up. So like Homebrew is ready to use, Homebrew Task is ready to use, Homebrew Bundler, which I'll kind of talk about in a minute. Um, and basically just gets this kind of basic state. And why, why is that kind of useful to install this stuff without any software? And why am I not installing any software? So I'm not installing any software because I'm quite picky about like the stuff I have in my system. And I, I find it really annoying when I've worked at companies where they tell me to run something which installs like hundreds and hundreds of things that I know I don't use or need. You know, a, a classic example might be your text editor. I use TextMate, most people in my company unsurprisingly use Atom. So if I have Atom auto install for me, I get annoyed because that's a waste of disk space and blah, blah, blah. blah. I probably shouldn't care about these things, but I do, and other people do as well, so they seem to like this. Um, 
And the other thing is basically just trying to have like a minimum expectation of stuff like Google being installed, stuff like the Xcode, Xcode command line tools, which is basically stuff like the compiler and things like that being installed. And what that means is that all the other scripts we use internally in GitHub can make some assumptions about that. So they you don't have every single script checking that it was going to command line tools were installed, checking the homebrew installed, all this type of thing. So that it just provides a nice base set of assumptions that these various tools are installed and they don't need to be installed again. So let's have a look at and see what it looks like to actually run this thing. So I've downloaded that little script as I said before into my downloads directory, which is where the default is going to be because I just click on it. Um, and then I run bash download strap passage. It's asking for my password immediately because it needs to do a few things with the root user. Um, and then it will go and churn away and eventually end up with something like this. So in this case here, you can see that it's like, I know it should full output the script to show everything it does because it's kind of all in the readme and it's not super interesting. But like the last step there has gone and installed a bunch of software for me, which is a little bit confusing because I just said it and I go and strap doesn't install software. So that's something that I added relatively recently because with Boxing, something that people liked about it was that they could kind of customize all of the software that was installed. So if they say used uh, TextMate, they could make it so that when they ran Boxing on a new machine, it would install TextMate for them. And I was trying to figure out a good way of solving this problem without forcing software people didn't want it, but allowing them to customize it. But at the same time, not having to have all this. The other thing with Boxing is this all had to live in a big GitHub specific repository, which there was no really good reason for. So instead, what I have is brew files, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on. Um, they have in our bottom of that file. So there are, I think this would be kind of critical brew files, which is kind of like a, a gem file or whatever, but for homebrew packages instead. It's a lot more simplistic than gem files because homebrew doesn't support the same kind of level of version pinning and stuff like that and vendoring that um, RubyGems does for various reasons I'm going to go through now. But it's kind of brew files are then consumed by a tool called homebrew bundle, which again behaves a bit like bundler does with gem files. So what that lets you do is it lets you provide a list of software that you need in either your project or globally, and you can say, okay, well, install all these lists of things, check that they're all installed, and do things like set up system services and stuff like that. We'll talk about the project stuff, like how they live in projects in a little bit when we see what a project bootstrap looks like. But for now, what this has done here is this is because in my doc files repository, are you often, is anyone familiar with doc files repositories as a thing? Okay. So if you're using like a Mac or a Linux system, generally you will have a bunch of your configuration files which live in your kind of home directory. And they all are prefixed to the dot, which on Unix systems tends to make them get hidden by default. So those configuration files are generally stuff that you may want to bring between different machines, uh, and you may want to kind of keep track of them. It might be stuff like, you can see here, my, my editor, you may not be able to see that, has a little bits of customization there, like the, the host name, I'm British and therefore a lot of terrible jokes, so my MacBook's first name is Mike Book. Um, uh, 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 thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the host name is green, and I have a little blue bit, and then on the right it has the directory. That's, I use the SSH, so that's important to that blue bit on the right as well. So that, like, elements of customization like that, like, it would be pretty dull to have to do that manually in every machine I'm on, or manually copy into a certain place. So a dot files repository is like a pattern people have started to use where you have a repository that stores all these configuration files and then through some means either copying or whatever, like in my case, they were assimilated back into the original location. And what that ends up meaning is that I can have all my configuration for various applications live in a Git repository, which I then host on GitHub. So that means I have that one repository that installs kind of all my settings that I would want to bring across multiple machines in a single GitHub repository. I can kind of keep track of my changes, but most importantly, I just have a public place I can use to share that with other people and share that with myself across different machines. So in this case, I have a root file, which is in the root of my uh, .files repository. And what Strap has done is Strap automatically knows to look for when it, because it has my GitHub credentials, it then looks when it's setting things up. 
does a repository called microquade slash dot files exist? And because it does, it will then clone that repository to my local machine, run a script setup, which I'll talk more about that sort of pattern we use in GitHub as well. So it runs a particular like, file script to kind of set up the repository. And then after that, it will then run the proof file if there is one in the repository. So then doing that, it means that when I have my system bootstrap by strap, I have all this stuff, all the software that is going to be also installed every time I run strap on a new machine, but that's not software that's going to be installed for anyone else, because that's software that I specifically requested myself. So you can see at the top, text makers up there. There's not many people using text maker anymore, but I still am. So I get that installed on the machine along with some various other things. So that repository for strap itself is open source. You can use that. That's with my GitHub account, it's my complaint slash strap. As I said, it's mainly just a bash script and a very simple kind of web application, which you can like, there's a one that installed to put that on Heroku. And then you can see next in my dot files repository, we've got this, the text is so small you can't read it, but we've got the brew file, which is in the root, and then a description of various tabs, which are like third party repositories, you know, speak, casks, which are like GUI applications like Google Chrome, whatever, uh, or things like Java that are provided based on stuff that's not open source. And then Gurus, which are the main packages we use over the number And then you can see this is the Homebrew Bundle repository. This is uh, GitHub Homebrew slash Homebrew Bundle. And this is the stuff that lets you do all your kind of running things from brew files and automatically installing all those tabs, groups, and tasks that I mentioned before. You can also use this to automatically set up services if you want to do that. So we'll talk that's particularly useful when we talk about project stuff later on. But if you want to have like a MySQL server or whatever, then it will actually start that and get it running rather than having to rely on you to kind of manually do that. And also it's going to be worth noting if you do use your group, you can just type group bundle and this will be to run and set up for you. So I now have, thanks to Strap and uh, the bundle, I now have all of my kind of custom software that I want on my machine. I now have um, things like the Xcode command line tools, the compiler, stuff like that, Git, these type of things installed on my machine. So now that I have that, the next step is I want to go and clone the project I want to work on at the company. So we have the GitHub organization on GitHub, unsurprisingly, and then we call it the GitHub website. That's called GitHub within GitHub. So inside GitHub, we call refer to the GitHub kind of main website as either GitHub GitHub or .com. And um, so we this results in a few other silly, terrible jokes. Um, like we have because it's .com, we have a channel in our Slack where everyone posts pictures of their dogs, and that's called .com. <laughs> and because we we kind of do a lot of stuff, I'm not going to talk about it much in this talk, although there will be a little sneak later on. And we have to work on stuff like chat ops, which is, I guess, almost like a way to send commands to servers and stuff through your chat client, through Slack. And, and similarly, there's a channel where people post pictures of their cats, and so like cat ops. I can see that the humor is draining fast. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so if you were just doing a git clone of GitHub GitHub, which takes ages because it's an enormous repository. And then after that, I have my GitHub clone. And then I want to get all set up so that I'm ready to kind of work on the GitHub project. Again, at most previous employers, this is when I go and if I'm lucky, I have a wiki page that describes the 8,624 different steps I need to follow to make sure this project's set up. Invariably, this, this hasn't been updated since the last person joined the company two years ago. So it's all wrong, none of it works, and I spend a week crying and bashing my head against the desk, trying to desperately let the company do me work. Let me do some work for the company. Uh, GitHub has a nice little pattern for this, and we tend to have, in every repository, pretty much, or certainly every repository contains code, we have a script directory. Um, and this is a pattern I'll talk about in a little bit called scripts to rule them all. So we basically have this idea that every effectively getting set up on any project should have the same sort of interface. 
for a developer who's put in that project. So I shouldn't have to read, even the readme, I certainly shouldn't have to go look at the wiki page or whatever how to set up this particular project. And I shouldn't have to have some complicated external tool that does all this for me. So instead we have this script bootstrap. So if you run this script after you've done the repository, then what you should have after that is a completely working setup that you can then use to start writing code, you can run a server, a script server, you can run all the tests that are going to be run in CI by script CI build. And there's basically three or four different scripts that kind of do different stuff like this. But effectively, the script bootstraps the important one is that kind of does all the setup. So in GitHub, GitHub's case, this is probably the most complicated one we have in the company because it's obviously setting up the main kind of mostly monolithic Rails app, and then it sets up kind of a couple of microservices that you kind of run in the background when you do that. So this is a kind of churning way. It's installed a bunch of gems. It uses from the bundle to go and set stuff up. It's going and cloning some other repositories. It's building a custom like our internal fork of Git. Um, all our internal fork of Git stuff makes its way upstream eventually, but we're just we test new things before they get released in Git itself. And then it's now like building nodes, building engineering packages, etc. So it takes about, I guess, a couple of minutes every time you run this after the first time. And the first time it takes maybe 15, 20 minutes. And um, so at the end of that will be done, it then has told us that it's it's all set up and ready to go. And tells us that the Ruby version is running, it tells us a little bit old because we're now on a newer Ruby version. Um, and then I can now run the script server after that to set up a server of real uh, this, The repository I mentioned before, uh, there's, we've got a repository that kind of documents this kind of pattern of having a script bootstrap set up, etc. It's called it's GitHub slash script to rule all. I'll have a, a page at the end with all these links, so don't worry about that, I'm that now. And that kind of has example scripts for each of these, and then like a read that explains like, what they are and a link to kind of a longer blog post that explains some of the motivation for why we do this. So you can see this a little example of the bootstrap script there. Again, the code's a little bit useful to read on the screen, but if you go and look there, you can see an example of kind of double the type of checks we tend to do on the projects. So after that, I've got all my patches installed in the system that I need for GitHub. I've got the services running because what it will have done with the brew file is, as well as installing all the software, you can specify for stuff like MySQL that you need to go and then start up. So, again, for me, that's a, a general kind of thing with Homebrew that Homebrew doesn't always do all these things automatically for you. Homebrew, when you've got a Homebrew command, tries to really modify the files it needs to modify and then tells you if it's going to kind of modify something system wide, it, it tells you how to do that yourself what command to run rather than doing it for you. So the nice thing about this, about having some like proof files, it means you can then say not just the software you want, not just the software you want to be set up, but then how to do that and when to do that as well. So you should go to run group bundle or strip bootstrap which calls group bundle itself and have that then set up and get all the services running, MySQL, Redis, Memcache, whatever, like all of these should be up and running at the end of you run that. So it's now time, now I have all the services running, now I have I'm basically ready to go, I can now actually write some code. So I'm going to run TextMate, I'm going to open my beautiful TextMate editor, and then I'm not going to show you anything that I'm actually writing, because that would be boring. Uh, and then at the end, we've got a particular file to say that I modified. And um, this is actually like a real example, I was going to screenshot while I did this. So I've modified like one of the models, because we're running the main app, is just like a really big ass Rails app. As I mentioned before, we have a few microservices on the side, but it's mainly most of the logic, most of the interactions with GitHub with the main Rails app. So I modeled this one file, so I modified this one file, which is a model for the hook, which are webhooks, which are like outgoing requests you can sign up for on GitHub to basically say when something changes, send me an HTTP post, which will then notify you of change that's happened. So I modified this file and then I'm going to just do the basic kind of get GitHub get workflow, create a branch, commit to that branch, make a nice commit message. So in this case I'm just 
what I was doing in this change was something pretty simple. Uh, we have, like, again, normal Rails stuff and then some kind of weird stuff on top of Rails. So we had this Rails attribute that we want to basically ignore it so nothing else can touch or use this attribute before we remove it from the database. So I can now, this attribute was ignored and then we removed it from the DB and then we can ignore, remove those little like ignore things. So I've written a wee commit message that explains what I'm doing here. Probably can't read most of the text, so I'm going to jump through these. And then I'm just pushing that as a new branch to get out itself. So after that, I'm going to go navigate to GitHub and then create a new pull request. So a slight difference since I last did this talk is that now I use this as a command line tool. Has anyone used Pub in here? Yeah, one person, awesome. So if you like doing lots of stuff with the command line, which I do, there's a command line tool called Hop, runs ones on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Basically lets you interact in various ways with GitHub without having to go to the GUI, uh, sorry, the GUI, the website. Uh, so you can do things like fork a repository, create new pull requests, uh, create new repository, stuff like that all from the command line without having to go there. So I can now just run Hop PR, and then it will go and create a new pull request based on the branch I'm on, and then open up another little editor, like a commit message editor there, which basically prompts me for the message I want for my pull request. So that's a kind of handy little way of like, spending more time and time. But so, we're doing it manually here, just, I went to the repository, it shows this recently pushed branch down here, and then I can then go to create a pull request here. So, as well as, Create pull request has been auto populated with the message that from the commit. But then underneath a foil or pattern we do at GitHub where we tend to kind of we now have like reviewers you can specifically request on the side, but what we used to do before that is just like CC various people who would be kind of interested. Because of GitHub we have so many people working on the main code base, it's a big Rails app. Not many people actually watch the GitHub repository because the amount of email you get is just absurd. Um, so instead, when you want someone to pay attention to a particular pull request, you tend to CC them, they receive a mention and an email or notification, and then they can come along and give it a review. So here I've CC the person who's working on this before, and then the team I'm currently working on so they can have a look. And the other thing that's very culturally important with GitHub is that like, every pull request has to have at least a couple of emoji, otherwise there's no way it's high enough quality to go into the website. Um, so we then have, after that, the request has been created. I think like most projects now, but I would recommend if you're using any projects and you don't want to use this, we have a bunch of continuous integration tests. Um, the open source projects, Travis CI is a really good system to set these up, and then there's ver you can either set up your own server or pay someone like Travis um, if you wanted to set this up for private repositories. So we have like a really, really wide array of continuous integration uh, tests. We actually have more like physical machines doing continuous integration testing than any other type of machine in the company. Uh, so it's significantly more of them than like web services. And um, so we have, for example, like the one of the most gnarly ones here, the Enterprise 2 GitHub. Basically that, we have uh, a product called GitHub Enterprise, which is like you get to run GitHub yourself in a VM, it costs, like quite a lot of money, but it's really useful for companies who basically insist that none of their data leaves their kind of company network. So what Enterprise 2 GitHub does is it builds basically everything that goes into that VM, builds the VM, starts up the VM, and then runs a series of tests against that VM. So that runs every time someone pushes a commit to GitHub. It will run all this battery of, I guess, what's it say here? Uh, 15 different checks there. I think we're now up to like 20 or 21 that all kind of run in parallel. So having this much testing gives you a lot of confidence that you've not, obviously you can still break stuff and have tests be green, but it gives you a lot of confidence that you've not kind of made some sort of basic errors or equally that you've not done something weird like everything works fine on the website, but you've actually broken like the enterprise product. So while I'm waiting for all these tests to run, uh, this is when I start interacting with chat ops. So this is in our Slack client. I send a little message that says, cue me to deploy GitHub slash hook remove at Inur 
which is the branch name I was using. GitHub is like the, the I guess the repository name. Uh, and then to production canary. So what on earth is that doing and why is there a dot at the beginning? So basically we have this internal tool called Qbot. It's a little bot that predates us using Slack. We used to use Campfire, which was 37 signals, like former kind of chat client before Slack started eating everything. Um, and Qbot is this little tool that you can basically send commands to and it will respond back to you. So when you're actually running, sorry, when it's actually responding, basically what it's doing is looking for messages which have a certain prefix, which is now dot in Slack, um, because we used to use backslash, but that's now like Slack internal commands or integrations. So when I do this dot qme, then Qbot is gonna go look through all the scripts, see if it has any scripts that handle that. Qbot scripts can be written in either, uh, I think, JavaScript, CoffeeScript, or ShellScript, like, or Ruby. So we generally have like CoffeeScript for the really simple ones or ones that just access web services. And then ShellScript or Ruby, depending on how complex it is and whether it's speaking to external servers or whatever. So in this case, this is basically like adding me to the deployment queue. Because everyone at GitHub uh, from day one has the ability to deploy, and because a lot of people are working on the main Rails app, we have to have this queue so that we're not kind of all bumping into each other trying to deploy at the same time. And also, I'll talk a little bit more about our workflow in a second, but we basically, we don't have, some companies you would have one deploy a day or kind of batch when you have three or four deploys, they go all out together. But what we do is every single pull request we create gets queued and then deployed and then merged by the individual who created the pull request. So what that ends up meaning is that we don't end up with deploying, for example, once a day or five or 10 pull requests at a time, where you can have something breaks, you're not really sure quite what, and then it could be any of the number of pull requests, so you have to back out the deploy and figure out which one's the problem. With this system, it means that you can go and deploy, and if something starts blowing up, and you can immediately back out the deploy, and you know it's the specific pull request that's causing the problem. So I queued, and then Qbot replied saying, okay, I've queued you to deploy the branch, and there's one person ahead of me in the queue. Um, thankfully, because I live in the UK, like most of GitHub works from, I guess, San Francisco time zone at least, like the west coast of the US. So the deploy queue gets quite long during San Francisco working hours, but normally when I'm working, like there's almost no one using it. So I get a nice short deploy queue. So I only, in this case, have to wait like a couple of minutes. So the next step is um, I'm going to go and see who am I waiting for right now. So I'm waiting for Arthur, unfortunately another person in Europe who is awake right now. So I have to wait for him to kind of finish his production deploy. So what that involves, which I'll show you in a second, but what he's doing right now is basically just making sure after he's deployed that everything is okay, running some kind of basically kind of manual checks of the feature and like monitoring all our kind of ops monitoring tools to make sure everything is within expected parameters. So by now, all the kind of CI checks have passed in my pull request, and then I have this other guy on my team, Miguel, who said that this looks good. Again, posted another emoji, because it's very important to post lots of emoji, uh, and he's basically just giving me some nice compliments about how my PR only contains deleted code and not any new code, and about how that's great. So now this pull request is ready, pretty much, for me to deploy to production. So once I'm up in my place in the queue, I can then get a little message from Qbot that will tell me you're up to deploy, and then it's, again, the branch name. So I'm now gonna go and use the, I used dot q before. I'm gonna use the dot deploy command, which is how I deploy to our servers. So I do dot deploy, GitHub, and then to production canary. So you might wonder what the canary thing is about. So that's like, has anyone heard the expression the canary in the coal mine? Yeah, a few people. So basically what they used to do is when they were coal mining, I don't know if people still do this, but they used to take a canary down in the coal mine. So if there was like a gas leak, then the canary would die first effectively. And then if you see the, the dead canary, then you're like, oh, okay, we should all get out of the coal mine before we all die too. So this is, it, it's a little bit strange when you 
talk about production web services in the same way. But basically, the Canary deploy is effectively a an initial sort of safety check. Again, the vast, vast majority of the times, there's never any issues with any deploys. But the Canary deploy is basically just deploying through a subset, basically more or less one machine of like each of our types of machines to make sure that like nothing blows up when it goes to production. So if people start seeing errors on the site, it's going to be you know one, two percent of people see errors rather than 100 percent of people seeing errors, which is not what you want. So uh, it's now listing all the machines it's deploying to, one of each particular type, and then after 30 seconds, it says the deployment is done, and then tells me to watch for exceptions in Haystack and perf issues in GraphMe. So basically, Haystack is like our internal sort of new relic bug snack type um, exception tracking tool. So it's basically just saying, like, go and have a look at that, make sure you haven't broken stuff, make sure there's not new errors that are occurring due to your change. And then, like, prompts me to go and have a look at this dashboard, which has since changed a little bit. But basically, we have this dashboard I created called the Deployment Confidence Dashboard, which is basically so a short list of graphs that indicate the most common things that might go wrong when you deploy. So you're basically looking for kind of bad things happening um, after the blue lines in which you've deployed. So there's a few weird things that like slower queries that kind of spike based on ra not random events, but based on kind of background events. So you, there's certain things that you're almost keeping an eye on the pattern rather than necessarily just keeping an eye on it going up or down. And then the rest of these, these are all like exception buckets in Haystack. I'm basically just trying to make sure there's not any big spikes after my deploy, i.e. I've not introduced some sort of massive error which is hitting a bunch of people. So then after this, uh, I can then, the Canary, uh, Hubot has told me, okay, well, it's been in the Canary deploy long enough, and then I can start deploying to production. So generally, we always kind of recommend people deploy to the Canary, but again, like a, a GitHub cultural thing in general, both the way we tend to build a product and the way we build internal tools is we don't tend to forbid actions. We, we tend to discourage them instead as much as we can. So for example, we tell everyone to always try and deploy Canary first, and in all the documentation it says to deploy to Canary first, but you don't have to do that. If you're 100% if you're sure this is something where it's, you, know, you don't need the Canary deploy, say you're deploying some change, I don't know, I can't think of a good example right now, but something where you happen to know that it's not gonna cause any issues, um, then you can choose to deploy straight to production, but then instead of, almost as a slight warning, Hubot, who can be quite rude on occasion, is just passive aggressive. So Hubot will say, I think, um, deploying to production without Canary, eh? A bold strategy. So it's a funny little thing, but again, it's, it's a nice way of thinking if you're building these type of tools about how you can sort of, you know, if you don't want to forbid something, you can still have sometimes little humorous messages which maybe point out to people like, okay, you're doing something a little bit strange here. Just so you're aware, this isn't the normal way people do this. And it's just that little helpful like nudge to make sure that you're definitely sure you're doing the right thing. Right, so it's now deploying to production, like to all the rest of the servers. That took, I guess, two minutes, two and a half minutes or so to do so. And then after that, it's telling me to watch the same stuff. So I'm gonna go back to the deployment dashboard, keep an eye on these graphs for you know five, 10 minutes, and just make sure that things are kind of behaving as expected. While this is going on, I'm going around the site, debugging, like making sure that things are all behaving as I expected. If I added some new feature, making sure that the feature is behaving as expected in production. So it's worth mentioning this, I've slightly simplified some stuff here. In this specific change, this is how I would have pushed the production because I know that it's zero risk and it's like very, very, very simple. But if I was actually developing a feature or something like that, I wouldn't be going and just writing code, pushing it straight to production to test it and stuff like that. So we have a bunch of like segregated environments with separate either data stores or just separate like front ends and stuff like that. Basically just different ways of testing our code before it hits production, as well as doing local testing and test suites and stuff like that. So although this is a simplified workflow, I would not advise you, are, if you're building a system like this, that you typically go straight from writing code in your editor to pushing it to production. That's generally 
the way that problems occur. Right, so after all this has been done, I verified, as I said, that the code is working fine in production. And then after that, what we do is merge the pull request. Some people find this workflow a little bit strange because we end up quite a lot of the time with what's in production is the contents of a branch and not the contents of master. But the reason for that is if we want to cancel the deploy, we don't have to then start reverting commits in the master branch. Anything that gets deployed into production is then merged and then into master, and then that will be used as the base for all future PRs rather than merging into master and then you need to revert and anyone else who's built a new branch of master needs to revert within their branch and then all the stuff get very complicated. So finally, this has been merged. I've deleted my branch and everything like that because I'm being a good boy. I will still keep a little eye on the deployment confidence dashboard until after the next person merges because I just want to make sure that there's not any you know, instance that crop up later after the time. But then after that and after the next person is deployed, then obviously I'll still keep an eye on making sure that you know no new exceptions are being raised by the code I wrote or anything like that. But I'm then generally off the hook to let the next person then worry about monitoring this stuff. So as you can see from our deployment strategy, we tend to, like none of this involved anyone in ops having to check something for us or anyone in ops having to kind of manually do the deploy. We have kind of a bit of a joke in GitHub that like we only have one person who works in ops and that person is Shebot, our bot. So the goal is that developers should be able to do everything like this. They should be able to push to production. They should be able to set up new projects. They should be able to deploy product, new projects to servers and things like that, provided the servers are already being, like they physically exist, without having to get the ops team to do that stuff for them. And what the ops team focus on is mainly writing the tooling and the monitoring and providing effectively the services such that the developers can push this code without needing to involve them. And I think that it ends up working a lot better, in my opinion, because it ends up with when you have developers who are monitoring this stuff, and similarly we have developers, I think all of our developers now are on some sort of pager rotation for making sure that they get notified if there's problems. It means that you move away from the system, which I've seen in previous companies, where like developers are just pushing code to production and then they can go home and it's the ops people who are getting woken up in the middle of the night. It's the ops people having to go to the developers and say, your code introduced performance regressions or your code caused this problem or that problem. It's much nicer, I think, to provide tooling and infrastructure so that developers can have like the ability to do this stuff themselves without having to ask permission, but then also the accountability that it becomes obvious if you push a change in this way and you break everything, it becomes obvious that that was you who made that mistake. And that's not a good thing because it allows everyone to you know, shout at you or whatever, but it's a good thing because it means that you can then learn from that experience and then you can go and have, we have like internally like post-mortems if there's incidents like that, in which we all kind of get together and try and figure out what needs to be fixed so that this can't happen next time. And those fixes are almost never involve specific people changing specific actions, but involve having additional tooling or additional process or basically better ways of checking this stuff so that this type of thing can't happen again in the future. So I've kind of walked you through most of the steps uh, that we kind of use. So if you remember, we bootstrapped our, our new laptop. We then cloned GitHub. We bootstrapped GitHub. We then wrote some code for that, committed it, created a pull request, deployed that pull request to production. We then made sure that the pull request was behaving as expected and then we merge that, and then the next person is ready to do the same. So if you aren't using a Mac, if you aren't using GitHub, then let's see what I think a slightly more generic version might look like. So this is what I think, personally, pretty much all organizations with more than a handful of developers should be kind of working towards. So you should have one script or tool that you can run, which gets your laptop basically to a sensible state, so as well as the stuff I mentioned earlier with installing bits of software, installing things like Homebrew, it also applies a few security policies we have, turns on full disk encryption on Macs, and then sets things like a little message on the lock screen if my laptop gets stolen that someone can kind of like message me and hopefully return it to me. And then there's things like, and then after that you should have, you should be able to clone the project you're working on fairly straightforwardly. I wouldn't imagine that's a problem for most people if you're using GitHub already. 
I would suggest you have a single script that you can run to bootstrap your project instead of documentation. I wrote a GitHub blog post about this a while ago. I called it runnable documentation about the idea that if you are writing documentation, even within that, for this stuff, I would suggest trying to turn, instead of saying run these five steps, try and make that a script somewhere, try and have that script run automatically, because documentation goes out of date very quickly, but then scripts that are being always run, and particularly being automatically run, tend to not break, or when they do break, they're noticed by people more quickly than documentation is. Then, obviously, writing some code, committing it, creating the pull request. I would say, as I said before, I think, Again, if you have more than a handful of developers, the developers should be able to deploy to production without needing human intervention. There should not be people SSHing into random machines. They should not need to ask permission for doing things. And then you should be able to verify a deployment without doing, like just having to click around the site and see if you've broken things. You should have stuff like exception trackers set up. You should have monitoring tools set up so that you can kind of tell with graphing and notifications and people getting paged when stuff is broken rather than you having to kind of rely on you noticing it, or even worse, your users noticing it for you. And then finally, after you're able to merge a pull request, you should be able to move on and work on other things. You shouldn't have to wait around for hours and hours to kind of make sure that the stuff you've merged is there, because again, when you have enough people working for a company, there should be enough of a pace that there's kind of deployments happening and people paying attention to it all the time without it having to take up days and days of your time to do a single deployment. So. Um, just for random interest, I, I guess GitHub, I think, does a couple of hundred of deployments, I think, a day, roughly. Um, like some of the numbers might not add up for this, like it appeared, but that's because it's, they're kind of staggered such that people aren't waiting at the same time. And in general, very, very general principles. So let's try and all focus on automating stuff when we can over running manual commands. Let's try and script things when we can, rather than copying and pasting lots of commands from documentation. Let's think about chat ops and using that, setting up, if you can, bots in your chat client over SSHing and manually running commands. Another benefit from that, our ops team, if anyone uses, well, DevOps team, I guess, uh, uses chat ops more than anyone else. And one of the reasons for this is during an incident, if you're trying to fix something by SSHing into a machine and running random commands, you can maybe tell other people that you're running those commands. Maybe you could set up Tmux or whatever so people can watch you, but if you're running that in chat, you have all of that stuff that you've run and the output logged in your chat logs. And people can join and leave the chat session and see like what is being run and by who and what the output was. So you can have a lot more kind of collaborative problem solving and debugging. Let's think about automated testing over manual testing. You should really have some sort of automated test that run when you create things like pull requests, rather than having to have people who manually go through and test everything. That's still valuable in certain ways. There's still things that you have people who work in QA or testing, there's still stuff that they're gonna catch, which all the best automated tests in the world are probably not going to. And then finally, we want to have monitoring systems that kind of notify us with either pages or phone calls or whatever uh, and send us messages and show us graphs rather than again having to click around the site and notice that things are broken by doing that. So here's some of the open source projects I mentioned. There's Mike McQuaid Strap, which is the Mac bootstrap system. There's the Homebrew project and there's Homebrew Bundle. And then from GitHub, there's the, that GitHub slash scripts to rule them all. So, thank you very much. If anyone has any questions. Yeah, so if you use, like, this, I guess two ways of hosting GitHub pages. So there's, like, like my domain, mikemcquade.com is in GitHub pages, and then you can have sites like, I don't know, like mikemcquade.github.io. So if you use the second one, like the username, rather than a main domain, you can make that HTTPS today. So there's like a little button in your repository settings that lets you say make that HTTPS. And, but then if you use a main like domain site, like microquid.com, because you would need to have your private key and stuff like that to make that SSL connection, you don't support that yet today, but it's something we're working on and it should be done so quickly. We use .io. Yeah, so if we use .io, you should just go to put HTTPS in the front. 
And if you use the, uh, by going to the repository settings, you can force it so it's only available in the application. Yes. So if they're kind of very close to the capacity or whatever, then 